Hello, everyone. This is Mick Emmett from Semitext. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, uh, welcome you uh, to today's Docker monitoring webinar. We're happy you took the time to be with us, and we plan to make it worth your while. We've got a lot of actionable content, some diagrams, and also some how-to steps. Uh, a few things to note before we get started. After the webinar is over, we'll have a short Q&A session. So if you do have questions, please submit them via the questions tool that you see on your control panel. Any questions that we don't get to during the Q&A, we'll address individually via email after the webinar. So if you do have a question, uh, we will get to it eventually. We'll be sending out a follow-up email after the webinar that includes a link to the recording of this, that you got the presentation you're going to see today, uh, some relevant Docker content, and also the slides uh, that Stefan will be presenting. So before we get started, I'd like to just give you a brief overview of who we are, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Semitext, some of you no doubt know us as a search and big data consulting company with the focus on solar and elastic search. Uh, we also provide production support for these two search platforms. But for today, what's most relevant is that we build on-premises and cloud services for performance monitoring and also log management, both of which feature first-class Docker monitoring and logging support. SPM, the monitoring tool, is a monitoring, alerting, and anomaly detection solution for many critical applications like Docker, of course, CoreOS, Spark, Elasticsearch, Node.js, and many others. SPM also covers core infrastructure metrics and advanced features like distributed transaction tracing. And you'll see some of SPM for Docker as part of today's demonstration. Logzine is a centralized logging tool and among the other capabilities, it exposes the Elasticsearch API, it works with Kibana, it has built-in alerts and anomaly detection, and probably most useful of all, it integrates with SPM and correlates metrics, events, and logs. Uh, and speaking of logs, we're holding uh, some Docker logging webinars uh, in two weeks, and I'll include links to that in the follow-up email if you'd like to join us. All right, well, let's get started. I'd like to introduce today's presenter, my colleague, Stefan Thies. Uh, Stefan is our DevOps evangelist, and he's also our in-house Docker expert. He's built most of the Docker monitoring and logging services uh, you'll see today, handmade by, uh, by Stefan. And he has a lot of insights into Docker that should help you better manage your own Docker setup. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Stefan. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's start with the agenda first. We have a talk of about 40 minutes, so I would like to show you what, what will go on. So first of all, we will talk about Docker monitoring and some basics regarding Docker and monitoring Docker and different deployment options for Docker agents. I think the technologies I show are very general. In some samples, I might use the our Docker monitoring agent because I know it best. Uh, then we have a second part of the presentation, the application monitoring on Docker. Uh, uh, Stefan, sorry to interrupt, but I uh, yeah. can't see that actual slide, if you want to pop that up so folks can see the agenda. So now it's better. We should be back here. Yeah. There we go. All right. Thanks for your patience, everyone. All right. Back to you, Stefan. Okay, it looks when I switch the window, the uh, transmission stops, sorry. Uh, okay, let's have a look again to the agenda. Uh, two parts mainly about Docker monitoring, and the second part is about application monitoring. It means that we monitor details of application runnings on Docker. For example, if you deploy Elasticsearch on Docker, you might want to see how the query time is. And uh, as deployment changed on Docker, also deployment of uh, monitoring agent has changed on Docker. So let's go on. Uh, every one of us has different reasons to use Docker. I assume the people here in the webinar are using Docker, Docker already. The first time I used Docker one and a half years ago to set up bare metal lab equipment simulating situations where elastic search nodes join and leave the cluster. Uh, we had uh, already too many virtual machines running and such tests were really resource consuming. 
uh, at that time I learned Docker and I liked very much the features, uh, the simple packaging of application. It was really lightweight compared with the VMs where we had to copy gigabytes of uh, of virtual file systems and uh, used a lot of main memory to run it on the lab equipment. And the ability to set resource limits helped us to fit the lab setup on the existing hardware. Uh, well, that's a little use case saving a few hundred dollars for lab equipment hardware. hardware. Uh, if we take this experience to a larger scale uh, and with Docker lending itself to automation, the saving of resources and engineering hours means actually continuously saving potential non-trivial amount of money. So that's really interesting on Docker and uh, beside the business side, I think we should first start with the technology, so how uh, Docker does the magic. Uh, on the left side, I hope the screen is still there, uh, we see the Docker clients. Uh, this is the command line tool uh, most of us know. It connects via the API to the Docker daemon. The Docker daemon is managing the images and the containers. Images are a kind of virtual file system, so the processes running in a container are limited to this file system, and containers are processes uh, running in, in a Linux uh, control group, so this is something we need to understand about Docker. Um, images are managed very efficiently using the union file system. So for example, if three applications use an Ubuntu base image, we download only one time the Ubuntu image and then the changes that different applications have are only little differences. So Docker is very efficient in, in storing these images. Uh, then we find the execution driver. Uh, here is Docker portable across multiple container formats. At the, at the beginning it was using LXC Linux and uh, today they use their own library called lib, lib container. And what is really great on Docker is it provides very advanced Linux features uh, but makes it easy to use. For example, the control groups which allow to put limits to processes like memory limits, CPU limits, and namespaces for sandboxing. Uh, basically, if you have two containers, the sandboxing means that a process in one container can't see the process in a second container. So this brings uh, isolation level. Uh, recent development, uh, which is part of the Docker daemon, is uh, lock drivers. So they have recognized that locking is an issue, is a topic to talk about and they implemented lock drivers which makes it possible to forward locks to different destinations like to files, to syslog and so on. Uh, on the right side we see the image registry. I think the Docker Hub is very popular. So many people put Docker images there with pre-configured configured applications and uh, you can simply download an application from there with a little setup, you have complicated applications running on your Docker host. Uh, enterprises have other needs. They might not be able to share their applications in the public or have license key in size or no permission to share with. So what they need is a private Docker registry. It's possible to run their own image registry and the company Docker launched also a platform called the Trusted Registry. So, but I think that that's all I would like to say about Docker so far, but most impressive is the growing ecosystem around Docker and the number of platforms supporting Docker already. We see here Amazon, ECS, Google Compute Engine, there are new operating systems like CoreOS and RangerOS. I will go into details for, for these two operating systems later. And we see cluster managers like Kubernetes, Mesos, and Docker Swarm. Uh, 
For us as vendor, this is pretty cool, uh, knowing that Docker solutions work on all these platforms. Uh, on the other hand, organizations that want to use Docker get a set of new challenges, and I have seen those challenges. First of all, is starting learning new technologies, and Docker is changing the way we deploy applications, so it influences immediately the workflows, so we need new workflows for the deployment. One example is a developer could nowadays create a Docker image. It goes to, to testing platform, and later on the same, same image might run in production. And that's why orchestration of applications, imagine we have now many predefined containers and we want to build a larger application and uh, to assemble this to, to one uh, big application that this is called orchestration of applications. And monitoring is part of the application stack and I will show later on also how, how to put an agent in, into the orchestration tools. Well, and then there was logging. Logging changed a lot with Docker. We were used to have logs in log files. Every log is going to a different log files. And Docker provides a stream of the console output of the processes, which is uh, really different from, from logging that we have in a traditional way. And that's why we do a separate webinar end of September. Uh, to cover all the logging topics. So let's move on to the main topic today. It's uh, monitoring. And first of all, the motivation to, to monitor. I think it's everybody of us has different reasons for monitoring. Might be uh, tuning, qual quality assurance, or capacity plan planning. We have uh, SLAs with our customers. so. There are simply many reasons to do it, and, but the main thing about monitoring is that we need uh, uh, we need a base to make the right decision. So when we monitor things, we see exactly what is going on, going on, and on that base we can create our decisions. So let's see what we need to monitor on Docker. Um, nowadays, we have not only one server, we have often multiple servers combined into a cluster. And on the servers, which are then Docker hosts, we see running multiple containers. These containers can run diff uh, different applications like Elasticsearch or Node.js. So there are different technologies used inside. And Therefore, we have to monitor the, the runtime environments and the applications and the container matrix plus the server and the cluster matrix. I think on, on this picture, it gets very clear that the monitoring stack changed. And beside the server, runtime, and application matrix, we get a new layer, not on top, not on the bottom. It gets here right into the middle, which is a bit of challenge for all monitoring uh, vendors at this point. Uh, to, yeah, to get an understanding of monitoring on Docker, I would like to ask the audience about uh, yeah, what is the result of VMstat when started in a container? Do you think it's the operating system metrics limited to the container? Or do you think these are the operating system metrics from the Docker host. I'm very interested to, to hear that from you and give me a second to, to start the question. I hope you see now the question and you can, can answer it. So great, we we got the results, and the most of you got it got it right. So it's showing the 
matrix from the Docker host and not the matrix limited to the containers. It, this means you are all very experienced here. And the insight we get from, from this is that we need new tools to monitor Docker. So the traditional tools are not enough. So let's see how we can get Docker metrics. The regular way is to use the docker stats command. In this case, I call docker stats together with docker ps, which lists all containers. And we see then the, the container ID, the CPU usage, the memory usage, limits. And that's really interesting on Docker that we see these limits. If no limit is set, we see the memory of the host system. And we see here the net IO. For me, this is too simple. We don't see a container name. Humans are used to use names and not, not the IDs. And we don't see the image name, which is typically the type of application, like Nginx. For a web server, we don't see it uh, with this very simple command. Uh, there is the Docker API. It provides much more information. And if you're not used to use it directly, we have here an echo command, which sets a HTTP command to the Docker API. We uh, communicate via a Unix socket using netcat. And the Docker daemon ends with, with more than uh, 70 metrics. Uh, this is too verbose to follow on the screen. So we need automated tools that uh, collect it. And one time I had the situation where I want to verify the received bytes um, compared to that what our monitoring agent uh, de uh, delivers to the backend and displayed in the user interface. And so I used then a little tool to filter the specific metrics out of the, the 70 metrics in, in the Docker API. So basically we use here again HTTP command use netcard to communicate. Uh, log agent is a little tool I wrote. It's kind of Swiss knife for, for logging data. In this case, it simply formats the JSON output to, to the YAML format where we have each metric in each line. And then it's easy to, to grab for a specific metric. Here the received bytes and the Docker API is updating the values uh, every second. So this leads us to the question, which metrics are most relevant for a general Docker monitoring solution. And we have then a list of key metrics for Docker. Yeah, the server level is very clear. We have here all traditional metrics we watch on servers. How, how, what is the load of the server? How is the memory usage? What capacity uh, do we have? or do we reach any limit. Uh, very special to, to Docker is we should watch the disk space uh, because Docker images consume a lot of disk space. Imagine you have uh, three applications. One is using Debian, the other Ubuntu, the third one uh, Red Hat Linux. We get, all, got, get already three different Linux distributions downloaded uh, to our disk. So we have to watch carefully the disk space uh, what, what you see in the little screenshot is what we call bird's eye view. It summarizes the server metrics for all servers in an application. And what we do as well is we put automatic alerts for the disk space so you get notified uh, before your disk runs full. Yeah. Then if you look at the container level, we have very similar metrics to the operating system level. Uh, but there was a new thing, which are the limitations like counters for failed memory allocations. Uh, then network metrics are very important for Docker because sometimes it's complicated to set up the networking between different uh, containers on different hosts. So the, the chance that we see there are some network errors is, is probably higher than, than with uh, very static configured virtual machines as the world with containers gets more dynamic. I think people tend to stop and start containers faster 
than let's say deploying new virtual machines to, to some platform. And at that point, I hope this works with changing the screen. I would like to do a little demonstration uh, of hitting such limits. Just a second. I can get to my console. Okay, I will run here a Docker command to start an Ubuntu container. Install something. No, 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 it's a little editor. So what happened? The container, the, the process, the install process here uh, got killed. Why? I started the let's exit it. I started the container with a limit of memory four megabytes in the interactive mode, so I could type in something manually, and uh, not the the main process of the container crashed, which is bash, a sub process I, I was starting manually uh, crashed then. And what we get now from, from Docker, we should see the fail counter of the memory allocation, and we should see uh, events happen, so like out of memory events. So if you give me a second to switch to my application. Oh, it's visible there. Let's go to container memory. About 30 minutes. That is Ubuntu machine. And we see already here that we hit fail counters. The number is high because uh, the, the number of allocation is, is high. And we can see here events. I think this was as I started the container. We see here start, create, resize of the terminal, and attach the interactive terminal. And this part is then interesting. Yes, here it is the out of memory event that happened in the container. So the last one was this one. And we can drill down to the specific container which had this problem. And can see, yes, this had a lem memory limit of four, four megabyte, and, and really all the memory fail counters was coming from this application. To, to finish the key metrics of, of Docker containers itself, it's like our predefined dashboard here. We see the host CPU, the container CPU, aggregated for all the machines. As I mentioned, you can drill down with filters to image level and container level. Uh, we see container memory and its limits. Interesting, there was no memory failure before my demo, so these memory failures are coming from my demo. Uh, the swapping activity of the container, so we really have a lot of details already in the overview slide. We see the I.O. throughput of the containers as a summary of all, and uh, the current network traffic, and if there were network errors, we see also network errors, maybe when I go an hour back. No, there was nothing. Okay, I think that that's it for the key metrics uh, of Docker itself, so let's move to the presentation again. Yeah, beside the key metrics, we have seen that Docker events are really relevant for container auditing. We see all actions that the Docker uh, daemon is executing, uh, including this out-of-memory event. And in, in real life, in such a situation, we would get interested uh, what ha happened exactly before this out-of-memory uh, was created, and then combining logs and metrics 
helps us for faster troubleshooting and we don't have time today to, to go more in detail so uh, I'm looking forward to, to see you in the Docker logging webinar then. And get to the other topic of how to deploy Docker monitoring agents. That's the first question when you create a monitoring agent, where, where should it run? Uh, should it be the traditional way? It runs on the Docker host, it has full access to the operating system, but then you find out about all these Docker platforms, the new operating systems like CoreOS and RangeOS, which are container-only systems, and on these systems it's not so easy to install something directly on your host, so everything should run in the container, and uh, if you look into monitoring solutions that have no possibility to run inside of a container, you face these limitations on, on such modern platforms. So watch out how the agent is installed. I think it's an important point so that you don't go in, in a one-way street here. The, the second possibility to deploy monitoring agent is to run it in the container itself. That's the best way. It's portable across all platforms. It has some requirements like it needs the privilege to access the Docker AP and, and the host metrics itself. And this is why at Zimmertext we decided uh, to go, sorry, this is why we decided uh, from the very beginning for an agent which is able to run in a container. In this picture you see typically we use the Docker Unix socket. It's possible to connect it also via TCP, but then you need to add the certificates to it. And the monitoring container runs in parallel to the application containers and, and delivers the metrics to, to the backend. Uh, the portability is a big point here and the question is then how to distribute uh, this container on all the platforms that we support. So I would like to give you a little example how the agent is deployed. Uh, if you like to try it yourself, uh, everything is open sourced on, on GitHub. We deployed also the, uh, or published the image to the Docker Hub. Uh, to use the user interface, you need a registration for SPM. This is free too, so there's a free basic plan. No problem to, to try it out after the session. And I would like to show you how the monitoring agent is then deployed. It's, it's very common. If, if you look to other products, it's very similar. Basically, you use Docker One, which makes two things. It, uh, it executes Docker create, which creates a new container, and let's say frees the parameters we give. The second thing is it starts the container, so Docker One is a combination of uh, Docker create and Docker start. For monitoring agents, we like that they run in the background, so we set the minus D flag, and we can give a name that makes it easier to uh, address it on, on the terminal to say docker stop spm agent or docker start spm agent. The important point, and this is very common with other monitoring solutions as well, typically you have to specify how to access the docker API. So we use here the minus, uh, sorry, we use here the minus volume, this means uh, a local file, which is the Unix socket, is mounted into the container, so the container can read from this Unix socket, so it can communicate with Docker API this way. The second thing is then specific to our agent, but uh, other companies do it as well, that you have a Unix identifier for the monitored application, so in our case it's called SPM token for the Unix Unic identifier. And uh, when the application runs in a container and it is asking for the host name, typically it gets the container ID as host name as long nothing else is specified. 
for the monitoring agent, we like to see on which host it is running because we deploy one agent per host. So we pass here the host name from the Docker machine into the agent. Uh, I ignored the other parameters like tagging. I could tag my metrics for the whole demo. And this Loxene token, that's an Mick mentioned it before, this is our full text engine to search in, in logs and do analytics on logs. If you specify an application ID or Loxene token in this case for Loxene, then we have together all the metrics and, and the logs, which comes handy when you're going for troubleshooting. Um, on some platforms, like if you use SE Linux, uh, you might need to set minus minus privileged. Uh, better is to set the right access policy for SE Linux, but, but that's a little detail. You can, can ask us at any time if we have issues uh, with the privileges to, to run it. On, on many platforms, you don't need it. Um, yeah, and the last power meter, of course, the, the na uh, image name of the agent, which is in our case, the text SPM agent .com. Oh, that, that's quite easy. If you know Docker already, you read the documentation and you get started very quickly. And we thought, oh, let, let's support core, core OS. And at the beginning, this was a funny experience for, for, for myself. Uh, I thought it's kind of other Linux system and it takes me an hour to, to get an agent running there. Uh, but that was not true. I had to learn a lot about Core OS before we had the final solution in place. Uh, first of all, when you boot your Core OS machine, it has no package manager because it's uh, a container only system. Let's say the idea is all system services run in a container. There are some services available in Core OS, like the SystemD. Uh, as init system, fleet as distributed init system, and add CD for central configuration. So the question to me was then, how to distribute a monitoring agent to all core OS servers in a cluster? I'll show you this. If you look at this picture, this is the situation that we like to reach. We have multiple core OS servers, and the Docker agent should run, run only one time and on each server. In addition, in addition, we like to embrace the infrastructure that CoreOS has, like the etcd for centralized configuration, and we want to deploy, deploy the services with the tools available using Fleet. So let, let, let me show you an example. So etcd control is a tool to set configuration values and in the centralized uh, configuration store. So you say at the D control set a value, then you have a namespace. Typically you choose your own namespace for your applications and then the configuration uh, value. So we set up our token here in advance in at the control. Then the second step is to create a service file, the unit file for, for systemd and, and fleet. In my example here, I do a download from our GitHub repository. You might create it manually on your machine, or you use cloud config uh, to give it at the boot time of a core OS server. I can show you in a minute. And so if you have your service file, which includes the docker run command for the service you like to start, you can distribute it using fleet. So fleet control load SPM agent service, loads then the service description to fleet, and you can give the command to start it in the cluster. So I switch again window if you're interested, and I think it's interesting to show how, how the service files for CoreOS looks. This is our GitHub repository for the SPM agent Docker. Uh, I put there our documentation for CoreOS, where you have links to, to the agent service. 
and do the cloud config example. So the service file for fleet looks like this. So you have a unit description. You say something about the service, how to restart it or wait between restarts. You have uh, exec start pre is, is a command executed before the, the actual service starts and then you have the start command itself. And here you find then the, the docker one command like I described before. And the important point here is to distribute it via fleet. A simple flag where you set x fleet global equals true means this service should run on every server once. Uh, the alternative to, to download it and type in the commands for fleet is to initialize your virtual machine immediately with a cloud config file where you specify your services like I need etcd, I need fleet, um, configuration parameters where you find instructions for it. For example, if you deploy on DigitalOcean, you find on DigitalOcean the detailed instructions for it. And the specific thing we did here then is that we have then the unit description for the Docker agent inside of the cloud config file. It's exactly the same content you find in, in, the, in the service file I showed before. So two ways to deploy it to CoreOS. So, yeah, and the final example I would like to give for deployment is on Ranger OS. This one is very minimalistic, only 25 megabytes. It has by default no package manager. All system services are containers. Also the system services that the Ranger has already running are containers. Uh, no cluster manager by default. Of course you can install everything. You can run Kubernetes or Mesos, whatever on it. But by default it's very lean. And uh, to run a service, yeah, there's only the instruction to say restart equals always means when the machine boots, it is uh, restarting uh, this Docker file, uh, this Docker image. So in that way, we can start the monitoring agent on every reboot to make sure that it's running. I think we covered well the topic of Docker agent deployments. Uh, I hope I was not too fast, so you can ask me questions at the end. So let's move on to the second topic we have. This is really about the application layer. And, um, and the idea to monitor applications that run inside of containers. So one word, what, what I mean with application metrics is, for example, a Node.js web service or a database or Elasticsearch. Uh, for each one, we have a different kind of metrics. This one, for example, has a Node.js runtime where we see specifics like garbage collections, uh, the event loop latency, or the response times of a web server. Uh, depending on the uh, technology of the applications that we are monitoring, we have uh, different ways to monitor it. This is very general. Uh, there are monitoring agents that we call standalone agents, and they use a remote interface like uh, JMX for Java. Other applications like MySQL, Nginx, or Apache has specific uh, endpoints where you can query the performance metrics. Uh, and it's based on network communication, so you connect to the application and, and query the metrics uh, from it over the network. The advantage of it is uh, there's no restart required when, when you, for example, you update the monitoring agent and you don't need to restart then the uh, application because they are completely independent from, from each other. On the other hand, standalone agents have limitations because they can get only the metrics which are exposed by those metrics interfaces. And therefore, for several technologies, uh, the uh, in-process agents are more attractive. 
it's kind of a library that, that you load into your process. For example, it's possible in, in, in Node.js and, and Java. It's very resource friendly. We don't want a separate process for monitoring. Uh, it's only an embedded library. And this library can have full access to the internals of an application. Like in Java, it's possible to use bytecode instrumentation. On, on Node.js, it's possible to hook into function calls. And that makes it possible to do advanced functions like transaction call tracing. Uh, basically, you can see uh, or measure how fast the function is executed. For example, you can see the fastest Opera uh, slowest operations which uh, succeeded or the slowest operations that, that failed. And because you see all the function calls inside of operation uh, application, you can discover how this application communicates with other applications. In this case, this is the app map that we built uh, on top of this in-process monitoring. So we can say this application communicates via JDBC to a SQL database, or it's calling HTTP, HTTP endpoints, and we can measure the time the application needs for each operation. So let's see how, how we deploy such agents. And there was, again, a scenario where I got asked several months ago well, how to deploy Elasticsearch, in, including the monitoring on Docker. Well, at that time, I was new to this issue, and I thought, OK, let's treat it like a virtual machine. We build a custom Elasticsearch container, install the monitoring tools inside, and let it run on Docker. And well, this works fine, but it has some disadvantages when we start then multiple Elasticsearch containers. We run also multiple times all the monitoring tools, which needs more resources. So it's not the best solution, and we all know there are ways to improve things. So the second step was then to create a monitoring agent container and use the standalone monitoring uh, with Elasticsearch. Uh, at this point, we need also a custom Elasticsearch image because we have to configure the uh, Java monitoring, JMX, and, and the Elasticsearch API on the Elasticsearch side. And on the monitoring side, we have to configure that the monitor can access the, the ports of Elasticsearch. When you run now multiple Elasticsearch instances on Docker, you have to do this setup for each port. So you need to manage uh, which instance is exposing which port. So that gets in direction of, of service discovery and automatic configuration. That, that's a heavy task. Um, in addition, uh, with this scenario, we, we lose then the uh, capability and nice features we have with the in-process monitors. So there is then a the second scenario where I show how to use in-process monitor. Uh, that's much simpler because in this case we can use the official Elasticsearch container and I think that's a general issue with monitoring um, Elasticsearch or other applications. There are official images and monitoring has special requirements. If, if you think about the JMX uh, metrics interface, the, the most Standard containers don't expose these metrics interfaces. It's something we need to add. So either we ask the vendor of these official images to provide a, a possibility to expose it so we can use it because containers have clear interfaces, or we build our own images. In this case, with the in-process monitors, we can actually use the official image, means uh, we mount a volume from the agent, and the in-process monitor is then loaded via a jar file coming from this volume, and it can write back the metrics to the same volume, and the sender can forward the data to the backend. 
that's uh, really great to set up. There was a little example. I see we are uh, late in time, so uh, there is the SPM client image, Sematext SPM client. It exposes the volume uh, or the directory where it is installed. We give it a name, SPM client. We set up the required uh, settings for the monitor, like that we want to monitor Elasticsearch and we want to monitor the Java metrics. And then the second container is Elasticsearch with the standard port for the HTTP API. And the important part is here that we mount the volumes from the SPM client, so we have access to the directory of the SPM. And we set the Java options for Elasticsearch that it use here the JMX remote interface for the Java agent with our live query. And in that way, we can inject the monitoring code into Elasticsearch and get all advantages of the in-process in monitoring with this setup. It, it's quite easy to do. And it saves a lot of resources because we don't need to run those standalone monitors. A similar technology of the injection of code into running processes is uh, possible for Node.js. So in, in this case, it looks like that we install, uh, load a monitoring library. In this case, it's Zematex library, SPM agent, Node.js. And the latest version of Node, it's version 4. It's coming from the IOGS. And already in IOGS 1.6, there was this parameter, and now it's in the official node release, node 4.0, that it has a new parameter called minus R for require. So it requires first the module SPM agent Node.js before it starts the actual Node.js applica application. And in that way, we can add instrumentation for Node.js without changing the source code of the Node.js application. You see many Node.js monitoring tools uh, have the need that you change the Node.js source code. And I think that it's really great if you have Node.js in operations to be able to inject the in-process monitor without asking a developer to modify one line of code uh, to, to use a monitoring visit. So let's summarize what I explained in the deployment options for monitoring agents in, in one big picture. Um, for the application monitoring, Elasticsearch, Nginx, Redis, whatever the application is you run, uh, there is SPM client connecting either with a standalone or in-process monitor to the application and it collects the application metrics and forwards it to our backend for processing. Uh, the, the other part is collecting metrics about the server, the images and the containers, the Docker events. So that's SPM uh, Docker agent uh, that handles this one and everything is sent to a centralized platform, and so we can create then an overview of all the details that happen in your platform or in your cluster, from server metrics of your cluster down to the duration of function calls in a specific Java or, or Node.js application. So I think that's quite powerful tool to use. And I see we are really late in time, so let's move on to the summary here. Uh, just to repeat what we talked about. So we have seen there are different layers of metrics, clusters, hosts, containers, applications. On each level, we are interested in specific performance values. We talked a bit about key metrics uh, for Docker itself. The special thing about having limitations to processes and how to monitor it. Uh, we have seen that logs and events are useful in this context to see when container gets stopped, starts, killed. And uh, we have seen that we have special needs for application monitoring. So in, not, uh, in many cases, we need a special image 
to uh, add application monitoring or we, we have to see how we can instrument official images from the software vendors. Uh, so this, this is the challenge with the application monitoring and uh, we have then seen various deployment options and the combination of the Docker agent and the application monitoring agent uh, together. Uh, what we couldn't speak today is, is about the, the log management in detail, uh, but that's again a thing for, for the next webinar. And I'm not sure if we have time and the people are still there. I'm open to, to answer questions. And Mick might, might help me now with, with the questions you have sent in the time between. Yes, uh, thank you, Stefan. Uh, we are going to answer questions now. Uh, and again, in case we don't get to them all, we'll follow up via email to everyone who posts a question. Uh, also, if you get a question, if you decide to try SPM for Docker, you know, feel free to contact us here at Semitex. Certainly happy to help you with that. And uh, lastly, we are, if you're also interested in Docker logging, we're holding some webinars on September 29th and September 30th if you'd like us to go uh, to join us and go into that topic specifically. All right, so let me, uh, let me go take a look at the questions here. First question, Stefan, uh, someone asked, is there any notification mechanism in Docker that will notify me when my container gets killed or hits limits? Yes, uh, you can do it on different levels. Um, First of all, we can put notifications to all metrics filtered to different levels. For example, you can say if a specific threshold is reached for all the servers together or all the images or, all the, or a specific container. So there are different filter levels for the alerts. Uh, in, with the specific example of the fail counters, you could then put an alert for one container or for all images of the application engine X and get informed when the fail count goes high for that or you set it globally uh, for for all containers and say okay if I see memory fail counts increasing uh, inform me and we have also anomaly detection for it. Uh, the second thing is about the events we uh, if you enable the logging features that we have with Logscene, we log all events to Logscene and we have also alert functions uh, for the log files. So you could also say if a specific log message like this out of memory message uh, appears many times, uh, noti notify me about it. Uh, there are several ways of notifications like email, pager duty, hip chat, uh, or you can attach any webhook, your own API. So in, in case you want to take some automatic action, uh, you could retrieve the alert and do some automatic action on it with the webhook. All right, uh, next question is, what is the footprint of your container? The SPM. Uh, Agent for Docker runs, in, it's implemented in Node.js, so it runs uh, with a memory usage of around 50 megabytes. Uh, CPU usage is low as Node.js is doing this async I.O. thing, so you are typically under 1% CPU usage with, with this agent. All right. Uh, next question here is, if I'm just getting started with Docker, which US or rather which Docker friendly Linux distribution do you recommend and why? Well, I made the experience at least with a few of them. Uh, I would say to, to learn about Docker, how, how it works, start with the Linux distribution that you use today. It's for the most Linux distributions available and uh, managing the containers there. Uh, is, I think is the right way to learn there. So you get all the basics, know all the parameters of these tools. <clears throat> then for uh, small devices, IoT applications like, like running it on a Raspberry Pi or something like that, uh, I think Ranger OS is, is really cool because it's really small, small footprint. There's no 
no overload on that, uh, but but you can use it also expand it to to full cluster solution with with add-ons like running Kubernetes in in containers. Uh, and for large-scale backend, I think CoreOS is really a good choice because it has already all the, the cluster wing features with the etcd, uh, yeah, and, and create deployment options uh, with Fleet, and of course you can run Kubernetes and so on on, on CoreOS as well. So it really depends on on your use case. All right, uh, I know we're we're close here. Let's time for one or two more. Uh, next one. I'm getting ready to run everything on ECS. Is there anything I should watch out for? Does everything you are showing apply to ECS too? Yes. Uh, basically, you have seen the Docker command and its parameters. On, on ECS, uh, you create tasks uh, via the API, but basically then this API matches to, to the Docker one command. So I, I think learning th these basic commands and then each platform has different mechanisms to, to trigger uh, the containers, uh, that, that's something everybody has, has to learn for the platform that, that he uses. Like I showed the, the service files uh, for CoreOS, it's just another wrapping of the, of the same commands which run, run at the end. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's just do, let's do a couple more. What is the advantage of running the sender process on each container versus just one? The sender process on each container. I, I see the advantage in running only one sender process for multiple containers uh, because then you save resources. So like the example I showed with the in-process monitoring and the sender process, you start multiple application instances and only a single sender process is running and collects the metrics and forwards it to the back end. Uh, if, so that's much better than deploying uh, the, this uh, monitoring sender process together with the application. Uh, you have only one instance, you save main memory and imagine that you can run one more of your own services instead of deploying one more of the monitoring services. So that's why I recommend to, to share the sender functionality between uh, multiple containers. All right. What metrics do you suggest we create alerts on? That's a good question and it depends again how your service wants. There are Let's say there are different use cases on Docker, like short running tasks and long running tasks. So if the majority of your containers are ser background services like databases or search engines, it makes for sure sense to, to have something like heartbeat alerts. Are these applications running or do they reach uh, some limits like query limits? Um, if it's a short running processes, uh, it's less useful to have uh, such uh, alerting about heartbeats. It makes no sense because these applications live uh, very short. Uh, for Docker containers itself, I think all these errors and hitting the limits are very interesting to, to put alerts on, especially if you have tuned your application and you use these uh, resource limit features. Like you say, normally my application doesn't need more than 200 megabytes, and if this really happens and it breaks out of, of these limits, uh, I want to get notified about these memory fail counters. It All really right. depends on your application. Yeah. Basically, we, we can put alerts on every metric uh, displayed in the user interface, and we can limit those alerts to all the filter levels. You might have seen in, in the browser that I was filtering by host, by image name, uh, or on the container level itself that you say, uh, this specific container makes always trouble. It's a long running service, and I want to be notified if something goes wrong with this specific container. So we have support for all those levels. All right, great. Well, there's there's only one more question, so what, we might as well do it. Uh, what is that log agent thing you showed? Log agent is actually a part of uh, SPM for Docker. 
when it ships logs, we have the, the challenge that, for example, on one Docker host, there's running Nginx and a Java application. Both have different log formats, and we don't get, let's say, specific log files for it, so in some cases, we have to detect what format is used when the application is logging. Is it log4j, or is it the, the standard uh, format of web servers, this common access log file format? So we detect these formats and uh, classified logs, and we can pass the fields out of it. And this is excellent for the, the analytics you do later on. Uh, you, so the web server is logging a text message, and later on you have uh, five or ten fields in your uh, in, in log scene where you can analyze uh, directly on the numbers, like like the request weight of, of a web server. So it, it does a lot of this uh, parsing work, and uh, we wrapped around a little command line tool so that you can use it on a console for standard in and format JSON logs to to YAML, or or you can use the parser like you have plain text logs and uh, output it in JSON, or you can add, for example, the log scene token and immediately forward any kind of logs that it supports uh, to log scene. Uh, so we made a pattern library which supports many applications. It's open source, and if anybody needs an additional pattern for a different application, you simply can go to GitHub, inject a new regular expression and, and some rules to process it, and uh, yeah, then it covers a new application. Very easy uh, to do. All right, great. Well, let's, uh, let's end it there. Uh, thanks uh, for everybody for attending. We appreciate you taking the time to do so. We'll follow up shortly with links to the recording of this webinar, the presentation, uh, some other relevant Docker content, and hopefully we'll see you in a couple weeks when we do the Docker logging webinars. Uh, in the meantime, feel free to contact us with any questions or comments. And again, thank you for your time.